How's it going everybody? This podcast is brought to you by Rise Make Life Workout, a health, self-development and lifestyle platform building a passionate community of knowledge seekers, creative dreamers and future leaders. For details on the latest Rise event that will feature expert speakers in the field of self-development and growth, check out www.rise-workout.com. That's www.rise-workout.com. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Rise Optimize, where we make science simple to optimize your health. I'm Dr. Shah. And I'm Sinead. And today we're going to be talking about functional fitness, mobility, and posture. Yep. My favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if those of you watching might have noticed that Sinead and I have both literally switched seats, but today we're also figuratively switching seats and you're in the hot seat today where we're going to be asking you questions and leveraging your expertise on the topic. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So to start with, actually, Sinead, I might get you to introduce just your background and sort of your experience, particularly in these sorts of topics. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I'm a musculoskeletal physiotherapist. I have worked as a physio for the last six years and I sort of finished up mid last year and have sort of switched my focus to studying um, to be a holistic health and nutrition coach. Mm. Um, and in addition to that, I've been a group fitness instructor for about 10 years. So I've always sort of been amongst the health and fitness realm. And yeah, I guess it's my years as a physio. It's, it was generally working with general pop and an active athletic population as well. So mm. um, I feel these topics were sort of commonly ones that I would speak about with people that I'd be treating and seeing on the regular. Yeah. What sort of... What do you define as gen pop and an, an active pop? Just to give a reference for people, because I think sometimes people who are very active might consider themselves gen pop, or mm. but we talk about them in those terms, and it's not always clear what we mean. Like, what is an active person? What, what? Yeah. I mean, I guess for, for me, I'd see general population as probably slightly more on the sedentary side. Like, they might sort of be relatively active, but maybe only like two or three you know, moderate to intense sessions a week versus mm. like athletic population where they are training every day. Mm. Um, and, and often more so with that goal in mind, like they are, you know, training in a particular sport or for a particular event. But I guess some people that maybe train at the gym every day would also still fall into that um, group as well. Yeah, like very highly active people because mm. generally the standards for activity to be considered or to do enough activity to meet the guidelines is around two to three moderate sessions a week. I mm. think that's ACSM or well, American guidelines. College of yeah. Sports Medicine guidelines. So many people that listen to this, as well as many people that we know, are, would be considered very active individuals, mm. really, wouldn't they? Yeah, and, yeah. and more, more than likely fall into the athletic population, whereas I feel probably like my mum and her friends would probably be more that general population, mm. which some of this information is still relevant for them as well yeah so. but anyway we should move on to I thought that would be a good sort of lead in to functional training mm -hmm. because yeah it's sort of applied more probably to gen pop but used as a buzzword in the fitness industry in some cases would you say definitely yeah, yeah. which is it's once you get into the research of it it is quite interesting that it is so like heavily used in the fitness space when um, I guess it, it's somewhat, well, based on the literature, it applies generally more to the elderly population mm. and general population. So, um, yeah, it's quite interesting that it does get thrown around a lot. Yeah, so I think it's going to be good. <laughs> so let's start off with what is functional training? Um, so basically it's any exercises that incorporate movement patterns that are common to performing ADLs, which ADLs stands for activities of daily living. Mm. I'm probably going to refer to that a lot. So you're attempting to train your muscles in a coordinated multiplanar way that you're incorporating sort of multiple joints, dynamic tasks, balance, uh, mm. things like that. So yeah, I guess a lot, like I said, a lot of the research was more done on elderly populations where th this sort of training is quite important in regards to their balance, reducing risk of falls, mm. and just their general day-to-day -day functioning of being able to do tasks around the home, whether it's laundry or vacuuming and those kind of things. Mm. So things of like activities of daily living would be things like driving or taking your groceries in from mm -hmm. the store, walking mm -hmm. upstairs, getting yeah. up from the toilet. Is that yeah. the kind of like... Yeah, day-to-day -day activities, which, and that's where 
I guess functional training is quite specific to the individual in that like my day-to-day function is going to be different to what my mum's day-to-day function versus my grandma. Mm. So yeah, that's where functional will be slightly different to everyone. And even functional for me might be slightly different to functional for you. But mm. generally it is sort of similar age and def- demographics will have similar function. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how, when you're embarking on a functional training program, how might that differ from if you're studying some other type of training in the gym, like just a pure strength-based training program or resistance exercise or... Yeah, functional training is usually, they define it as sort of, yeah, multi-planar, multi-articular versus traditional training or conventional training, which is usually more machine-based movements that you'd see at the gym. Mm -hmm. So I guess a couple of examples of that, like a functional things would be like step-ups, squats, deadlifts, push-ups, farmer's carry. Whereas more your traditional or um, conventional exercises would be more like your seated row, your leg press, your knee extension, lat pull down, those Mm. kind of typical machine based exercises. And I guess that's the type of movement that it's compared to a lot in the research as well. It's usually functional training versus traditional Mm. machine based um, exercises. Yeah, I guess we'll have more questions about the research soon because I'm about to ask what the research sort of says about the efficacy of functional training, I suppose, and the efficacy has to be anchored in, what I guess, what the, the main aim or goal is, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, if we could talk through. Unfortunately, our recording cut out here as Dr. Shah finished asking about the efficacy of functional training and what the research has to say. So the first half of my response is that there was a lot of variability in the outcomes used for each study. One study in particular looked at strength, endurance, and rate of force development of the trunk flexors and extensors and found no significant difference between functional training and traditional training, which is sort of no surprise given that they were the selected outcome measures. Another study looked at the functional movement screening score and the Y balance test. And again, these aren't the greatest functional parameters in comparison to say a reduced risk in falls, someone's gait or other functional tasks. It's also important to mention that no two functional training programs were alike. Most of them included a mobility aspect, some had a strength training component, others had a balance component and this is what made it quite hard to compare and determine what is a quote unquote superior form of training if any. Another study that when it compared functional training that didn't actually have a strength component to a purely strength training group, the strength training group did better in regards to increasing muscle strength. Mm. Whereas a functional training group that was more focused on ADL type activities, there was a significant reduction in, you know, risk of falls and things like that compared to a standard strength and balance program. So it was really that the effects are in accordance with the specificity training principle in that if a program was more focused on strength, then they're going to improve their strength. If it was more focused on balance, it was more likely that their balance improved. And I guess the biggest thing was that even if someone's strength was improving, would that necessarily transfer to an improvement in the ADL? Mm-hmm. So example, like if you had someone doing knee extensions, like would that actually transfer to them being able to get up and down off the toilet easier versus if they were practicing squats? Mm. So and, and the research seems to say that it's, it's, that's where it's preferable to do functional training and that there would be better crossover to ADLs versus sort of isolated strength training exercises. Mm. Does it matter sort of what age people are in terms of that transfer? Do the benefits of doing some of those more traditional training types potentially, you know, transfer over a bit better in younger people versus older people? Or is yeah. it, does it not really matter? I would say younger people that there would be a better transfer example like some people say you know oh you're a footballer or a soccer player why are you doing a leg extension that's not you know mm. functional but for them increasing their quad strength would probably transfer to them just being a better athlete in general mm. whereas I guess for the older population I, f- I feel that it's a better use of their time if they are doing general exercise to make it as functional as they can to help with that transfer I feel if if elderly people were doing the hamstring curls or Mm. leg extensions, they're probably not as great a transfer to their day-to-day activities as they would be with younger people. Yeah, if the goal is to sort of increase quality of life and and the ability to complete those. If you're like a a a master's bodybuilder or something and you're doing like 
hamstring curls or something, then probably yeah. all good, right? Yeah, exactly. A goal. Yeah, yeah. And that's <laughs> yeah. what I guess it really comes down to is that what is your goal? And to summarize, a lot of the research just says, yeah, the, the greater your training specificity, the greater your results and outcome is going to be, which... Yeah, I guess that was the general kind of consensus from most of the systematic reviews out there, given that, like they said, there was so much variability between programs and mixed sort of results. But yeah, overall, if mm. you can be more specific to what you're wanting to improve on, then you're probably more likely to improve upon that yeah. skill or activity. Yeah, it sounds like the research does seem to focus a lot on the elderly population mm. as opposed to a younger population. Mm. What do you, how do you think that interplays with the way that people perceive functional training and experience it in their life, like active people like mm. you and I who go to the gym and sort of hear this word thrown around? What do you think are the differences there between sort of how it's defined in the research and how it has been studied and the benefits that uh, cited as coming from that research versus what we're seeing in the fitness industry and what most people might first think of when they think of functional mm. training. And that's where I think there is a bit of confusion, I guess, because people will be doing different gym classes or exercises and people say, oh, you know, this is functional fitness. And mm -hmm. I think there's that part of them that's like, what does that even mean? Mm. And it is, it's, if you don't understand, I guess, what function is for you, then you probably won't understand if an exercise is functional for you or not. So example, if you're doing a burpee, tuck, jump, donkey kick, and it's like, yeah, this is functional fitness, but I would think, well, when are you ever doing that kind of movement in your day-to-day -day life or need mm. to do that kind of movement? And I, I do feel the term is more applicable to that older population where that, I guess, independence as you're getting older and that quality of life is so much more important to be able to do those day-to-day mm. -day activities like bringing your groceries and things like that. Whereas I feel we would be able to do all those things without special training but like you said example something like crossfit mm. if you want if that is a function of yours like you like to do crossfit regularly and you'd like to get better at those movements then i would say that is somewhat functional for you because mm. you that is part of your day-to-day -day regular activity yeah and if you want to be good at those things well then yeah you need to be practicing those things but is that function is like doing an overhead squat functional for like my neighbor john who you know, just mowing his lawn or whatever, I might not ever need to lift squat something, something that head squat, something yeah. overhead, like that's where, you know, does he need to go to CrossFit? Like maybe not, but mm. if he was doing it and I was enjoying it and wanting to get better at it, then like, yeah, keep doing it. Yeah. Kind of thing. So. And I guess if the, if the goal, when you sort of, your realm of activities of daily living start to include those mm. additional things regularly and the goal for you becomes that you want to move well while doing those, mm. then uh, you kind of expand the definition for you of what is functional, I yeah. suppose, is that, with that? I think, yeah, I think that's a, a valid conclusion to make. And same with things like, it's not every day you have to like lift your couch, but would it be good to have the strength that if you needed to move your couch, you did have the strength mm. to do that? And I think that's where maybe for some of us, our standard of where we want our strength to be might be a bit higher mm. than, than others. Like, I don't think you would have to train that hard to just, if you, all you, if the heaviest thing you were doing in a week was bring your groceries in, like you wouldn't have to train that hard to be able to do that. Mm. But you might just want an increased strength, increased functional capacity, depending on what it is that you're wanting to achieve. Mm. And so that's sort of where, where functional training could apply to younger people when we're kind of extrapolating the research I'm I'm guessing in terms of you kind of expand that definition of what falls under activity of daily living and then what your goals are is that yeah I would say they sort of almost kind of come hand in hand like what your function is and what your goals are mm. you know what you're wanting to achieve kind of with with both because I think for I mean if I was to speak for you and me I would think that our training would exceed what our day-to-day -day function is. Mm. Like we probably don't need to be doing the amount of training we are just for our day-to-day -day yes. things. Yes, yeah, that's a very but good point. because we want to have more strength and be good at this and be good at that and mm. we are sort of pushing those limits a bit more. Mm. Yeah, and so I guess in that, in that scenario where, you know, we might be engaging in a sport or we want to move well in a for a particular set of movements or something, it, would functional training be superior to other types of training or is it just another type of training that you could do yeah i think it is just another type of training but it still makes sense that whatever you're wanting to improve upon you should be training specifically mm. for that so it's like if you did have a big hike coming up where you know there's going to be lots of inclines and whatever then yeah you should be 
training for those types of movements mm. and again if you just want to get stronger with your squats and your deadlifts and yeah then you should be doing strength training but yeah I wouldn't necessarily say it's superior mm. but I would just say that it comes down to yeah what your specific goals are with the type of exercise you engage in and what you are wanting to get out of it mm. and if you do have a particular event or a particular sport then more often than not your training should be specific to yeah. that that really just those solid training principles really mm. isn't it of specificity in this case yeah. is so important yeah and that's kind of what's at the core by the sounds of functional training when we're talking about activities of daily living mm. is it's training that's catered to be specific to yeah. those to someone's function and their ADLs that they need to achieve mm. yeah 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 would you consider CrossFit or mm, like ceremony or what are some other ones like BFT? Is that functional training? I mean, I would say to some degree, yes. Like mm. some of those movements are going to transfer or correlate to day-to-day -day movements that we do. And then some of the movements, not so much. Like some of them are more so just there for that cardio mm. benefit you know and and again I think it comes back to if if something example crossfit or ceremony you do it regularly and you enjoy it and you want to improve upon those skills then yeah keep working at it but like day-to-day -day life do you need to be able to do a muscle up mm. not really <laughs> but that, that doesn't mean that it's like oh that's not functional you shouldn't be doing it yes, it's like if yeah. you're training to do a crossfit event then that it's is very functional relevant for you and it's yeah. relevant and you need to be working on it so yeah. whereas I guess the biggest ones that would have that crossover would be yeah, when you when you're doing step ups or mm, squats farmers and deadlifts, carries farmers and carries. Yeah. Yep. So, so there are elements of it that sort of fall into the realm of what in the research you see in functional mm. movements, like the farmers carry and step ups and things like that. But then there yep. are other parts of it that are, you know, not as yeah. functional in the more constrained definition, yeah. I guess, yeah. by the sounds and of same, it. And yeah. sometimes climbing a rope in CrossFit is fun. Yeah. You know, one day you might have yeah. to climb a rope, and you're like, yeah. I've have practices at CrossFit. Yeah, or handstand so. walking. What a great party trick, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, okay, cool. That's does actually this sort of dovetails nicely into the next part because sometimes what you see, or what I've experienced at least in starting to engage in some of these types of training and movements that you do see in things like CrossFit, like an overhead squat or something. So it's, it really challenged my mobility. Mm. Um, and you see that in a lot of people because some of those movements are very advanced and mm. we sit at desks all day and kind of become a bit stiffer. Or mm -hmm. So I guess that can lead us into our chat about mobility and maybe how how important it is for function mm -hmm. versus you know some of those more advanced kind of movements but I, it's always good to start with a definition so what yeah because often mobility and flexibility are mixed up yeah so what is mobility to begin with yeah so mobility it's good to see that as more I guess the dynamic or active it's your joints ability to actively move through range whereas flexibility is passive and it's mm. more the ability of your muscle or muscle groups to lengthen passively through range so a good example of that would be if I pulled my thumb down towards my wrist like that's my thumbs flexibility mm. whereas <laughs> if I was to try and do that actively without over pressure like that's my mobility right and you can apply that to most joints like if I reach my shoulder up like that's my active range that's my mobility in my shoulder mm. if I applied pressure and really stretched out that's my flexibility mm. or my passive how range. does so how do each of those relate to function so if you've got good overhead mobility how does that differ from having good I, I don't even know if overhead flexibility makes sense actually given the mm. definition that you just said but yeah. you know how do mobility and flexibility relate to our function day to day yeah so again that would come back down to what your tasks are or mm. what you want to be good at so like a, a good example in regards to shoulder mobility and that naturally like olympic swimmers would have more shoulder range than like you and i would mm. and that's obviously functional for them. That's what they need it for. Whereas for me, it's like, I feel I've got pretty good range and I can functionally do everything I need to do. Mm. I've not really ever done anything where I've thought, oh shit, I can't do this because I don't have good shoulder mobility. And I think if I did, if there was something I wanted to do and I felt I didn't have the mobility in my shoulder to do it, then that's when I would probably want to work on it mm. a bit more. Like you said, when you sort of first get into overhead squats, it's like, oh shit, that's challenging. Mm. 
and then that's when you want to work on something like that which to some degree just by practicing an overhead squat you're going to be working that range as well but sometimes I guess mobility exercises prior to doing your overhead squats would help with just at least getting that joint used to going into that range mm. um, so that the first time you're pulling the barbell up it's not like oh shit yeah you know that hurts or whatever just tightness across the whole chest yeah so it's good like... to sort of more open it up and get it primed and get get the nerves primed as well because that's I guess a big component of stretching in that when we're stretching our muscles you also your nerves are running through all those muscles mm. so when you're stretching your muscle you're also putting tension on the nerves which our nervous system for everyone will have a slightly different tolerance to stretch so a lot of times stretching or even at least dynamic stretching and mm. moving through your range is a good way to sort of get it primed and ready to be going into those range without the nerves being like whoa mm. yeah so it is doing sort of movement or exercises that require passive stretching or that sort of basically the flexibility that you're from mm. your definition that you talked about is that a way of trying to improve is it an effective way of trying to improve your mobility um, well, I mean, some say that like your mobility is like your flexibility plus sort of strength and control within mm. that. I feel that to some degree working your flexibility would help in whatever area you might feel that you're lacking in it, whether it be your hips or your shoulders. But I find you probably get your best bang for buck in regards to just doing that movement you want to be doing mm. in regards to like particularly regards to strength training. Like if you wanted, if you feel like you don't have great hip mobility and you're not getting great depth in your squat, then yes, definitely doing a bit of hip mobility work, but it's still, again, practicing your squat. And the more you're practicing, particularly with load, is mm. gonna help with getting into that range that you wanna be getting into. Mm. How long does it sort of take to develop that kind of, for that to develop over time? Cause it's almost, if you're doing them regularly, can kind of apply it like a training program right? yeah definitely yeah. yeah i mean and then some studies especially in regards to like static stretching um they say that like you need to be holding a stretch for a minimum of two minutes for it to really be having any sort mm. of effect so obviously when we're doing stretches at the end of a class for 30 seconds probably not doing a lot other than feeling nice yeah um and even i mean some research of like a, of a stretch program for like three to eight weeks so that there was no real significant changes in like muscle property or muscle stiffness or tendon stiffness but when you look at the specifics they were only on average doing about 20 minutes of static stretching a week right and that's when I was like well that's yeah not going to do a lot when you compare that to someone like a gymnast or a ballet dancer who they're both quite flexible mobile mm. populations and they're, they're doing that every day you know mm. at least probably an hour a day so and that's where I guess it like I said it comes back to what your function and your goals are with your training like if you want to be if you want to be able to do the splits then like yes you're gonna to have to be putting a lot of time into doing the passive stretches doing the mobility work but if you've got the hip mobility that you need to do what you want to do mm. do you need to be doing extra work yeah like for maybe that extra one or two percent gain in your mobility like eh. yeah it's right sort of weighing up like the time you've you've got in order to put into that, like if you've if you've only got a set amount of time to train, you're better off probably just doing your training versus spending all that time doing mobility work. Right, I see. Um, when you say mobility work, so there's the passive stretching and then mobility work. What sort of what does that encompass? So generally, it's it, anything that's taking your joint through its full range. Okay. So I mean, there are specific different protocols, like you might have heard of the FRC or functional range conditioning. So it's like an isometric loading protocol. Mm. And that's commonly used in, re in regards to increasing mobility and things like that. But really anything that's taking your joint through its full range of motion is going to be working on your mm. mobility. I, and I suppose that obviously the exercise is specific to the area of the body. So we could go through a bunch of them, but yeah, you yeah, sort of, correct. yeah. Like example, like when I go to a boxing class, usually we're doing like shoulder rotations, like circling your arms forward and back, opening your chest out, you know, again, targeting those areas that we're about to be working. Mm -hmm. So when I'm going to a boxing class, it's rare that we're doing hip openers and those kind of movements because we're not doing a lot of lower body stuff. Right. Whereas obviously... CrossFit, that's when, and you know if you've got a day of overhead squats, you are going to do a lot of opening through your shoulders, a lot of thoracic mobility stuff, rotations, all that kind of stuff to get your upper body primed to, to be doing those movements as well as opening up your hips mm. ready for squats and things like that. In, the, in that case, actually, so when you're sort of warming up, using the movements that are specific to movements that you're about to do, and you get a bit of purchase, so you, you mm. do free up a little bit, 
Mm. Is is there a point where it's not as where that sort of temporary extra purchase it could potentially yeah. be fifteen minutes. For f- fifteen minutes. That when you if you if you feel like you've gained that bit in range right. from doing your mobility or stretching, it's it's usually about fifteen minutes. Takes about last. fifteen minutes. That yeah, that those acute effects will sort of last. So mm. if you've sort of like you said, do mobility work and you're like, whoa, like look at my shoulder now, I can reach all the way back there. Like generally that will last about 15 minutes. And I guess the key thing is when you are feeling like you've gained range is then loading into that in order mm. to sort of make those adaptations with that new range. So example, Yeah, that's what I was going to ask is like, mm. what, you know, you've got that temporary bit of purchase, but then how do you sort of leverage that in a safe way to try to make that a longer term change in your mobility that yeah. transfers over to a few weeks later? Yeah. Or, you know. So it's, it's, it's now loading into that new range. So example, again, overhead squat's a great one. If you, if you are working on doing that, opening up through your shoulders, through your thoracic, it's, it's once you've got that extra gain, you then want to be loading into that range. So mm. it's not really beneficial, I guess, to do all those things and be like, oh yeah, my shoulders feel great, da da da, and then now I'm off to go do some walking lunges. Right. Like, <laughs> especially again, if it's once that 15 minutes kind of goes by, you, you know, those effects are going to start to reduce. So it's, yeah, you're wanting to do those mobility work before you're about to do mm. that specific exercise and then make sure you are loading into that new range to start to stimulate I guess more adaptations in that range mm. oh that's really that answers a question that I've had for ages it's very helpful yeah. so and that's where I like I, again see people at different gyms that have this full routine for you know rotations of their neck and their shoulders and their full body and then but then they go off and just do an exercise that might just be lower body and I think well you probably didn't need to do Mm. your neck and your shoulders and your this and your that if you're now not training into that range that you've just gained by doing your specific mobility work wow Um, that yeah that this is a really good point so to make your training both in your mobility and then in your strength work more efficient at the specificity of your mobility before your strength work yeah is key yeah yeah. If you want to, you know, improve yeah. both. Like yeah. if you know you're just kind of working on one specific area or if it's a lower body day versus an upper body, whatever it might be, it's sort of focusing primarily on those areas that you're going to be training mm. and loading into. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, but I can see how people could get into the routine of maybe coming to the gym and then going through their like usual, yeah, usual routine. Yeah. yeah, which like I said, often it, it, their warm up routine is longer than their working phase sometimes. And I just think you could be so much more efficient with your time. Like I think, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of mobility work mm. is, is really probably adequate. You know, yeah. it's, it's just doing what you need to do for that particular movement versus doing a full body warm up routine. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay, cool. That's really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, so is there any great need to increase our mobility or flexibility? Are we at greater risk of injury or pain if we Mm. don't? Um, Again, it's something that the research is quite mixed on, and I think that's because for something like pain and injury, there aren't so many factors at play in regards to why someone gets pain or why someone might get injured, particularly on a sporting field. Mm. So flexibility in some cases, especially in regards to like groin injuries in athletes, it does play a small part I wouldn't necessarily ever say it's the one thing like if someone strained their groin playing soccer and I assessed their hip and was like oh this hip is tighter than this hip boom that was your problem that's why you had a groin injury because your hip is tight it would be like one of many factors at play as to why someone may have injured themselves and again I think what would play a bigger part of someone's injury is generally more sort of their load their exposure to that activity like again if I can't do the splits and I'm sure if I tried to do the splits I'd probably maybe injure myself because I'm not used to that kind of load on my body and I'm not exposed to doing that regularly. Mm. So yeah, I think it would be more applicable to be kind of working on those kind of things of getting used to a particular movement, exposing yourself to it, building up your strength in it versus worrying too much about your mobility. Again, as long as you've got the mobility to do that exercise in the first place for example an overhead squat just because someone might be a bit stiff in their thoracic or stiff in their shoulder I wouldn't necessarily be like oh you're going to get injured doing an overhead squat if they had enough range to still do an overhead squat then happy days Mm. it would be more like building that load up from just a barbell to adding weight etc and over that time you'd develop mobility to potentially not not so much reduce an injury risk but I mean, perhaps, but more in that you'll be able to move something more efficiently mm. because you've 
got greater mobility to yep. be able to retain positions or you know things like that definitely uh, yeah i'd say it would, it would come down more to efficiency so same like i said with with olympic swimmers having you know compared to the general population have a greater range of shoulder motion that doesn't mean that if i swim i'm going to have pain or injury mm. just because i don't have amazing shoulder range but if i probably wanted to be a faster or more efficient swimmer would me having greater shoulder mobility help me most likely yeah that's and a then, good example yeah. and that's just where again it's like it would be a matter of like how important is that to you as a goal of yours to be an amazing swimmer then yes you should be putting more time and effort into mm. mobility of your shoulder yeah but it's not necessarily a big red flag or something that people should worry mm -hmm. about in their day-to-day -day training if they're generally able to yep. safely you know do most of the movements that they're engaging in and they're not Definitely. increasing the load massively you know out of the blue or because yeah. <laughs> i think otherwise it can just it can make another barrier to exercise for people because people can be like oh no i don't have the mobility to to squat therefore I shouldn't squat mm. when really you're going to be gaining mobility by practicing your squat right um, and gradually loading that up so yeah I definitely think it, sh it shouldn't be seen as like you said a red flag or a, like oh no you can't do this because you don't have the mm. mobility or the flexibility yeah yeah that's a good point I, I for a long time I was doing like squats just to 90 degrees now mm. I've got full ROM but I took ages to develop it mm. and it was only from doing lots of squats I suppose yeah, so yeah definitely um, I think particularly with squat a lot of times people say oh you know oh you've got tight ankles you need to go do ankle mobility work to before you can squat now mm. and it's like yes sometimes that's valid but other times I'm like the more you squat with load and practice forcing your knees out over your toes the more you're going to be going into your ankle dorsiflexion and increasing that range mm. so I guess like I said it, it, it does a lot of times just come down to what you're wanting to achieve and the time you've got if you've got time to do heaps more mobility stuff around that primary movement then cool but mm -hmm. if not then your mobility could just be a few squats body weight with light weight and then boom into my working set mm. yeah cool yeah that's um i think that's quite good because many people will probably yeah maybe feel like they don't have the mobility for stuff and they're stopping themselves from doing it when yeah. just a, getting into it slowly and yeah. building that up is actually the best way yeah the specificity Apologies team, it cut out again and it's the last time I promise it missed the end of Dr. Shah's summary on mobility relating to the specificity principle. She then asked how does PNF stretching and FRC, which is functional range conditioning, fit into the realm of mobility? So PNF is proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation and that is sort of based around this idea of contract, relax. So full or maximum contraction equals maximum relaxation. And you've, so you're working with your agonist, your prime mover mm. and antagonist. So example, to get more elbow range, if I maximally contracted my bicep isometrically for like 10 to 20 seconds and then relax, it should be full relaxation of my bicep. And as you repeatedly do that, you should be increasing your range right so then i guess in regards to the frc protocol and they talk about pales and rails which is progressive or regressive angular isometric loading loading it's basically lots of big words i know lots of big yeah. words and that's what i oh i sometimes hate about the fitness industry because it's like the bigger the fancy the words it's like oh wow that even must... my eyes are like going as you yeah. like the long acronym and the yeah that words. must be the thing to do though because it sounds fancy so basically it's similar to pnf in that you are doing that sort of at getting to an end range and you're resisting either the agonist or the opposite to sort of increase that range and then again ideally once you've got that slight increase in range you should be loading into that area and then they talk about cars which is controlled articular rotation so that's sort of about taking actively taking your joint through its full range which again i think that's just a fancy way of saying like yeah you should be moving like right people get a stiff neck and it's because we generally don't use a lot of our neck range because we're just sitting at a desk all day so yeah again that's I think just a fancy way of saying move, move yeah. your joints through their range. And I guess it's, it's not bad, it's just not overly that beneficial either because I think it's quite low intensities that you're doing those isometric contractions at. And it's kind of insignificant for real meaningful change in that, yeah, you might be gaining a little bit in range, but if someone's already got their range that they need to do what they need to do again mm. i think you could be spending your time doing something else yeah <laughs> like in regards to just again strength training in general of just getting into your workout really and, and working on the movements you want to be getting better at mm, and focusing on moving well yeah, yeah 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 i think as well 
a lot of their claims, particularly the guy that runs at Spina, Andrew Spina, he talks about that, like, you know, a lot of injuries occur at end range and that's because people aren't used to going into their end range. So he does a lot of work on that, but really a lot of injuries, particularly traumatic, it's just more that they're at higher intensities, right. which are like, you're not going to be prepared for that with those, with that kind of work that he preaches. Right. So like, for example, if you injure yourself on a soccer field during a tackle or something, it's quite high speed perhaps yeah, yeah. and high force that you're not going to be preparing for that exactly like well. even if you do practice because i think one of his things is like practicing walking on like the outsides of your feet and then the insides of your feet because uh, you know okay. saying that because people aren't used to doing that therefore when they their ankle goes into that motion that's when we get injured but like you said again you add in speed and mm. all those other things in regards to an injury it's like Mm. yeah speed and load yeah it's, <laughs> yeah yeah, um, yeah is there research on on how that transfers over on that particular protocol that he runs like in term in terms of injuries and things like that like soccer or team sports or running injuries or whatever or not not that i sort of come across mm. but i mean maybe i just need to dig a little bit deeper but i didn't find too much in regards to that so mm. interesting yeah i guess that we can probably move from that into talking about posture mm. so how does mobility and doing that kind of thing can it improve your po improve your posture what is posture <laughs> where do we start oh. you know yeah so posture is i mean simply put is your position of your body in space generally it is something that's automatic and unconscious for a lot of us and i think what people probably don't realize is that it is influenced by many factors not just neurophysiological and biomechanical but also psychoemotive so our emotions or how we're feeling can also dictate posture mm, yeah and that you know standing proud and versus you know feeling you know down you're naturally going to be a bit more sort of slumped as well and it's your sort of body's reaction to the force of gravity as well um your body's going to find i guess a position of somewhat least resistance and less energy required to maintain itself i think yeah overall it's been a cultural obsession that's been around for thousands of years now like it first became associated with the correct handling of a weapon back in the 16th century and then from there throughout like the 18th century 19th century that's where the notion of sort of good and bad posture became a thing oh, okay. um, and that's when the plumb line entered the medical literature which so is that is historically did it kind of come from a sense of what looked yes. right so it's an aesthetic sort of the idea of perfect posture at least is yeah. sort of an aesthetic preference that then kind of was transferred into something that maybe has functional benefit or not I guess you're going to tell me whether yeah. or not it does but so yeah, yeah definitely it was because like you know that picture of the ape turning into a human mm. and so therefore it was like it's primitive if you're like hunched you know right. you want to stand tall and proud because like that's the evolution of the human species and but yeah and then that's when the that plumb line sort of came out which is the imaginary line from like the top of your head to the floor in that you know perfect posture is like eyes shoulders hips, knees, ankles, perfectly stacked. Mm. And that's the perfect posture. And then, yeah, it did, like you said, sort of a good posture became a sign of like strength and health and beauty. And if you had poor posture, it was a sign of, you know, physical pathology and moral inferiority or whatever. <laughs> so, but then, yeah, I guess from there, it just sort of got really intertwined, particularly, you know, as the physio profession evolved and pain and posture just sort of became really strongly linked, mm. even though there wasn't great backing for that link in the first place. And it has been challenged for like, I was surprised to find this, that for over half a century, like the earliest was like an American physician in 1967. He was quoted as saying, there is no scientific facts to substantiate the benefits of this postural aesthetic ideal, yet a great deal of attention is devoted to correcting faulty posture. Mm. So since, yeah, the early 60s, there's been a few being like, why are we wasting our time, you know, trying to correct posture when there really is no such thing as mm. perfect posture and that like the general gist of current research is that posture variability is much more important so we should be focused on changing our posture and position throughout the day versus right so st it's still it's still retained that that us being on our phones or our computers probably isn't the best for our po posture because we're we're in that position for a lot of the day if we're not moving through other yeah it's, it's more that well. like any any one fixed static rigid posture is not ideal for us so even mm. if you sat up perfect all day long like you had your feet flat on the ground you know hip distance apart mm. you sat up straight hands in front of you chest lifted chin in perfect alignment if you sat like that for six eight hours a day 
like you're still gonna right be it, uncomfortable yeah because it's just more that yeah the body likes to move it's made to move it's going to be that built up of just you know mm. different chemicals throughout our body that are like hey yeah, and different pressure and it's the body just likes to move so i think instead of people worrying about the ergonomics which again there's also not great evidence to back up ergonomics and reducing pain people are just better worrying about moving more so mm -hmm. like setting a timer on their phone every half an hour to get up move around or and even so that that will be more effective at mitigating or preventing pain in mm. say a job where you do have to be in a similar posture for a lot of it like say like a bus driver or something if they mm. had more breaks throughout the day to walk yeah <laughs> which might be hard for yeah. a bus driver but they'll have to have some breaks then that would perhaps be more effective than all the bells and whistles with the right kind of seat and just yeah. fixing them exactly into the exactly that's the thing like you get these fancy seats that support your neck and support this and support that which I guess that will allow for them to maintain that position slightly longer. Mm. But at the end of the day, it's just better to move than worrying about all those things. Because like I said, you're still going to get sore regardless mm. by the end of the day. But I guess something like bus drivers, I guess their tolerance is probably a lot higher. Yeah, because they're basically trained for the position, Yeah, they're, trained for, yeah, they're right? trained for that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like I remember once having a truck driver who was like, oh, my back's a bit stiff. I've just come off like a 17-hour drive. And I was oh like, excuse me? I would not be moving like if I had sat still for that long. And yet yeah. that was just like his norm because he was a long-distance truckie. Mm. So I guess that's the main message is that there isn't like one perfect posture. People are just better off moving. It, it's really like it's a product of what you do majority of the time. Mm. Like if majority of the time you are sitting hunched, shoulders forward, then that's going to be your norm. Yeah, so. where I mean, I guess applying that same logic, if a lot of the time you're also moving your joints through their full range and things like that, would say your shoulder, for example, tend to sit a bit more neutrally in the socket because the tissues and stuff are not overly tightened one way or another mm. based on being in a the same posture all the time? Or like, how does it transfer over? Because we do have like a, I guess, a, there would be inherent tightness, you know, that restricts movement that might then also affect the way that it sits when it's resting. Yeah, to, yeah, to some degree. Because this is, I guess, where like posture correction kind of exercises come into play. Because mm. I see that often at the gym, you know, people will spend 45 or an hour in the morning doing all these like posterior chain extension based exercises thinking like yeah this is going to fix my posture and correct my posture because i'm rounded and, and therefore if i do like four lots of 10 seated row four lots of 10 lat pull downs and blah 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 that that's going to fix my posture but that's only one hour of your day for the next eight hours you're sitting and you're sitting in that hunch position like doing strength training obviously does come with positive outcomes and mm. that it does reduce pain and things like that but in regards to it changing your posture from a physiological point of view I'm like it's probably not going to do as much as you think it's doing right like I think people put so much focus on oh I've got to do all these posterior chain exercises to counter my posture and to fix my posture but if they're not acknowledging that they're not doing any movement throughout the day mm. and they're just sitting in a hunched position it's like well that one hour of posterior chain exercises would really be no different to just doing a body pump class for an hour right like yeah and I guess in that case too, people are thinking of posture just simply as like the way that they are when they're resting. But like you said at the beginning, posture is just what form your body takes in space. So mm. posture, you know, when you're about to do a deadlift or something, that's a posture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or like in the bottom of a squat, that's also a posture, right? So yeah. Technically, based on, is that correct? Yep, yep. Whereas people sort of think of posture correction as being, you know, basically how your spine's all and neck is all stacked, stacked on perfectly. top of each other and where yep. your shoulders are sitting and things like that. Yeah. As well. And that's where I think as well, people don't like, you've obviously got that mobility then. Like, if you can sort of retract your shoulders for like to set a deadlift, it's like you've mm. got that sort of range of mobility there it's just more the endurance of those muscles to maintain that all position day. all day which mm. like i said to then maintain it all day that's also a lot of energy and you're tensing then those muscles to try and maintain that perfect upright position which if you imagine like clenching your fist all day long like after eight hours of clenching your fist yeah. <laughs> your hand muscles would be bloody sore yeah <laughs> um and, and your just... joints would be sore <laughs> so it's the same thing if you were tensing all day to sort of sit upright and perfect like yeah you'd get to the end of the day and think oh shit i'm sore and mm. Yeah, so I think it's just 
to not be too hard on yourself for having an average posture because I mm. catch myself out when I'm slumping but it's just I then change what I'm doing or I change my position I will then sit on the floor and work on my laptop or yeah then sit at my chair and then kneel at my desk like I just sort of constantly try and change up what position I'm in mm. yeah actually yeah. this is sort of unrelated to posture specifically but like is there good evidence for standing desks so like ones that can transition between different heights and yeah. so you can sit and stand or whatever while you're working does that seem to help people with discomfort and pain related to having to be at a desk all day for I example th- I think that wasn't what like, when standing desk first came out people were like oh this is the cure to everything like everyone just needs to have a standing desk but then it's the same like if you're standing all day long you're probably still going to get different aches and pains yeah. you know <laughs> like I, I, I've had again clients that have gone from having a corporate desk job to working in retail and they're like oh my god my feet and my back and everything from being on my feet all day mm. because again they're kind of not used to it but also they're doing it for again eight hours so I think the idea still set up with a standing desk would be alternating like, yeah you going know, from if, sitting to standing yeah, yeah do a few emails sitting down a few emails sitting up or, or work with a client sitting down next client you're standing up again it's just having that constant movement would be the most ideal because yeah any any one position for a long period of time is not ideal mm. so even if it's perfect and your joints are perfectly stacked yeah like the body still doesn't like that kind of so it's no different to again like i find for me like eight hours sleep is my ideal if i sleep in for like nine ten hours like my back is sore Mm. and that's when i think well it's probably just because i've been in that one position kind of lying down for so long yeah so do you do you sleep like a vampire (laughs) no oh no no i sorry i obviously i alternate between (laughs) both sides and lying on my back lying on my tummy a bit of everything but i think it's still just more the no load on anything for that period of time and the fluid hasn't got a chance to move around and lubricate all the joints so and there's no strong evidence either for sleeping posture while you've brought up sleeping Mm. in that again whatever is most comfortable for you as oh yeah you see some of those reels on on instagram Mm -hmm. or tiktok or whatever being like put this pillow here and these pillows this side and it's like there's not enough room in my bed for all these damn pillows where am i gonna go and not to mention if in the middle of the night you gotta roll over and then you've got all these pillows that are you know you're gonna wake up in the night now yeah it's just and for some people that might help depending on if you are currently experiencing lower back pain Mm. then yes elevating your legs or putting a pillow between your legs might help for that period of time but I think yeah it's not necessarily like essential I have I mean over time like anecdotally have seen some people that you know have notoriously slept on their stomachs and have experienced back pain and for them trying to learn to sleep on their back has helped them Mm. but that's only anecdotally because I don't think there's any strong evidence for right like the perfect sleeping posture yeah because again it's your, your body generally moves mm. in the night. Oh, yeah, when you're sleeping, yeah. Side to side. You still might have preferences or places where you're most comfortable, but again, your body will generally just move you as it needs to. Mm. So, What are the sort of changes over uh, over a longer period of time, like as you age and how, how that kind of relates to posture? Because you know how as, as we age, many people end up sort of getting more hunched. There's also mm. sometimes osteoporosis that happens mm. like on the vertebra mm. that change the, like the curvature in the spine also yeah. changes and things yeah. like that. Is there any argument for some of those exercises, those specific postural correct? of exercises in helping that or is it actually just better to try to maintain a good level of strength and yeah. movement throughout your life <laughs> the latter that the, yeah. yeah most of the evidence just points to yeah the the stronger we can be and the stronger we and the longer we can maintain that strength the better so um versus again specific posture correction exercises like some of those things can be slightly hereditary like when you do see the people with mm. the quite you know notable kyphosis through the thoracic yeah. that's usually um a bit more of a genetic thing but i guess for for the average person it's your body's taking shape of what it's most commonly in so if you're able to again change that position up more often than not then you hopefully won't kind of get that set curvature as you age but um can't go wrong getting strong mm. oh that's a good rhyme yeah. wow that's a great tagline Sinead oh. <laughs> and, um, and my my favorite one in regards to posture is your best posture is your next posture oh um, you're really so, yeah. in a rhyming buzz today <laughs> So yeah, which basically it does just mean you like keep moving. Your best posture is just you know your next one. So just keep keep moving versus mm. stressing too much about not having ideal ergonomics. So I'm like that sometimes when I work for a while at my laptop and I'm like, oh fuck, I wish my laptop was higher because I, I find myself naturally looking down and the more I'm working, the more I'm getting hunched forward. But then I'm like, well, you don't have a standing desk, so instead that's when I kneel down or something mm. because then I naturally am more at 
eye line or change up my position. So we'll get yeah. a bunch of books. Bring yeah. Them out. But then yeah. I know even like once it's high, I know I'll naturally probably start to do that uh, where, you yeah. know, you're sort of, you get into that forward head position of your chin pushing forward. So, which is probably also not ideal, but mm. that's where, again, I just change up my position. So I'm not in one for too long. Mm. Nice. Yeah. All right. Shall we summarize what we kind of covered today? Yeah. We covered a lot. So, yeah. Yeah. So we talked about functional training mm -hmm. and whether it's superior to other training. Came to the conclusion that it's a type of training yeah. <laughs> and it can be useful, but just as likely strength or other types of training can be yeah. useful as well. That it, yeah, it comes down to yeah what your function or your specific goals are. Mm. And, and generally the more specific you can be, the better your outcomes will be with whatever particular movement that is. Yeah, do you think that the goal generally just of trying to move well through what you do do is a pretty good guiding principle? Like mm -hmm. in your sort of yeah. experience as a physio and what you've seen if, you, if people applied that to the way that they train, yeah. whether or not, so whether or not a particular class is technically functional training or not it doesn't mm. really matter but if you're mm. just sort of generally trying to move well yeah and if it's something again that you know you enjoy and you're going to do it regularly I think that's the, the other thing is like longevity with your training and mm. sustainability like and versus you know where you might train for a month and then you kind of get over that and then so you do nothing for a month and then you try the next thing like it's better to try and have regularity with your training and so if you enjoy something you're obviously more likely to stick at it so and if it's again achievable for you you're you're making progress you're able to progressively overload as mm. well throughout those movements then happy days mm. and enjoying it enjoy it yeah that's, yeah <laughs> that's the key thing yeah yeah and then we talked about mobility and how that differs from flexibility and posture as well how those kind mm. of all into play yeah yeah and yeah i guess the key thing there is like yes if you want to become more flexible then put time into static stretching but mobility again is, is probably best to get you pr your body primed for a workout, but you don't need to really be spending more than like 10, 15 minutes mm. doing that. It shouldn't really take up more than your workout time. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily, again, need to be full body, like again, target those areas that you are gonna be working. And because if you are making those slight gains in your range, well then you wanna be then utilizing that with whatever exercise you're about to do. Mm. So loading through it, yeah. And that's mm. the most efficient way to actually improve your mobility and the joints that you need to for the movements that you want to is mm. specific mobility before and then loading through it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, I forgot to touch on that study, but there was a study that did sort of compare static stretching of hamstrings versus doing a deadlift. And it found that obviously the deadlift was somewhat su superior in that it not only increased your muscle strength, but there was increases in muscle flexibility. Mm. So that's where it's like a deadlift is kind of a two for one deal versus yeah. like static stretching. You're just going to be getting over time that increase in flexibility. When doing a deadlift, you're going to get increases in strength. And also it's that loaded eccentric. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, did they, they made sure that people were loading through the eccentric and yep. not getting to the top and dropping it because yeah yeah because yeah, that eccentric part is really important because you're stretching through load but or lengthening through load yeah so yeah. i'd imagine that would have been more effective yeah actually than static stretching in that case yeah, yeah it was so so that's why i love deadlifts because i think you're getting a two for one deal mm. oh maybe i won't be so lazy and do <laughs> the crossfit trick and drop it at the top i yeah. don't well, i do do ones where i like lower down slowly but you know <laughs> i find i find personally like when my hand hamstrings have felt the tightest is usually when I'm not doing deadlifts regularly whereas mm. when I'm doing them regularly that's when I probably feel most mobile and yet sometimes people will think what, what do you mean like you're loading them they're going to be getting tight but mm. yeah not really because you're, you're again you're getting that eccentric loading component which is going to help lengthen them so mm. lengthen yeah. the muscle fibers and also stretch out the the connective tissue as mm. well which yeah. I think is a piece that sometimes is forgotten is that those connective tissues are elastic and so they sort of stretch too when you're loading them and you don't get that as much when you're doing a concentric, concentric. I don't think Definitely. no <laughs> yeah. And again, it, it kind of somewhat depends on the joint, obviously, like hamstrings, that is a good one to get that. Whereas I would feel the, I mean, most people have full elbow range. So mm. like focusing on doing an eccentric bicep curl is probably not going to give you that many gains. Not in terms of mobility, maybe in yeah. terms of like getting more uh, stimulus through the muscle. Mm. But yeah, not in terms of yeah. mobility because it's got a pretty hard end point. Yeah, eh? yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and I guess if anyone wants to find out more, hit me up at my, my new page at Health Coach Shanae, where I'm sharing more info on everything health related. Awesome, thanks Shanae. Yeah, thank you for doing that bit too, because I forgot that we rounded out by sharing our details. Yeah. Awesome, see you next time. See ya.